Um, I'm very excited to introduce my good friend Jaime Fernandez Vizac. He's a professor at uh, Princeton University, and he and I did our graduate school together. So we worked a lot on kind of similar subjects and, and collaborated together. And uh, he's been really interested in exploring, you know, the cognitive science side of things and how to think about, uh, you know, humans as other agents in a game and uh, how to plan and predict well around them. And so today he's going to be diving into some of these topics. He has kind of like, probably like 10 hours worth of cool material that he could talk about for this. <laughs> so uh, I think that this will be a little bit of a, you know, um, somewhat structured, somewhat flexible, choose your own adventure. So please be sure to ask questions if you have them um, and then we'll see how it goes. All right, so with that, Jaime, take it away. Wonderful. Well, first off, it's uh, fantastic to get to meet you all. Uh, Sylvia has uh, told me that you guys are fantastic at asking questions and uh, being engaged in class. So I'm, you know, I have very high expectations. I hope, uh, I hope that we'll have a, a, a fun discussion. So yes, much of what I'm, I want to, you know, first off have the disclaimer that much of what I'm going to uh, be talking about is actually work that Sylvia and I have done together. So. Um, I'm definitely happy to follow up with any of you, but you should also make sure you ask her about uh, um, you know, any, any of the particulars. And by the same token, Sylvia, please feel free to jump in uh, if there's anything useful that, uh, that you, you think we should uh, add. One thing, um, well, the first thing I'll do is uh, see if I can share my screen so that we're looking all looking at the same thing. Uh, uh, And as we said at the beginning, please stop me at any time. If anything isn't uh, very clear, I'm very happy to, uh, you know, uh, have a discussion or any questions. And similarly, if there's something that is not on the slides, but you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about, uh, you know, please feel free to totally derail the the lecture and let's talk about that because ultimately this is supposed to be, um, you know bringing you a little bit more of a human-centered perspective on much of what you've been looking at, which is the, the whole story of safety. So I'm going to uh, start with a, you know, very uh, unfair and simplistic cartoon of the way in which we normally think about safety analysis for autonomous systems. And that is that we have our autonomous system interacting with the world, some environment that we're defining as engineers. Our job is to think about the interactions that the system is going to have with the environment and characterize in some way whether we are confident that these interactions are going to avoid certain, certain failure modes that we consider to be bad and therefore we don't want. And so um, at some point we do the analysis and then uh, we're very happy and we're convinced that this, this analysis is correct. And then we want to deploy our system here. And so it turns out that the, this uh, kind of picture of us versus the world uh, is sometimes a little bit difficult to reason with because there's a lot of stuff in the world that is very difficult to characterize. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, multi-agent reasoning uh, comes into play. And that's where, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when we have uh, humans around. And so uh, I have this little cartoon. I'm not sure if the audio is going to get properly shared. Uh, if it does get shared, you will hear some ominous music now. Um, but in any case, we have a robot navigating the world and along comes a human and suddenly disaster ensues because the human is doing something that uh, the robot did not account for, or the engineers rather did not account for when designing the environment of the robot. So going back to a little cartoon here, uh, you know, what's happening is we're introducing a different kind of interaction between uh, the robot and these other agents called humans. And these agents in turn also get to interact with the world. And so this little check mark that we drew unless we somehow had an amazing model of the world that encompassed all of the other agents in the world in a way that is accurate and sufficient for reasoning about safety, uh, the check mark kind of goes away and we really have to ask, okay, what happens now with this, you know, uh, much more uh, multilateral interaction? 
And so, um, you know, under these conditions, the question of whether the robot or the autonomous system here, I'm just saying robot in a very, you know, in uh, very much abusing the terminology. Um, but it's not just up to the robot whether the robot remains safe. It's a matter of the actions that other agents might take in the environment and how those actions will couple with the actions taken by the robot. Um, so it's a bit of a more, uh, you know, a more subtle, difficult, but also interesting problem to work on. And that's uh, what's, uh, you know, some, some of these uh, new directions in uh, robotics and autonomous system are trying to pursue. Okay, so this little picture I wanted to show because this is how we have dealt with the problem of uh, humans in the environment for many decades in robotics. And that's by very carefully crafting these um, stickers that we put on the robot. And we make sure that nobody gets any ideas. Uh, and we then put the robot in a cage. And that cage now constitutes a structured environment where there is very little uncertainty. And we make sure that we put a sensor on the door of the cage so that if somebody opens it to get inside, the robot immediately stops. Um, and that's how we avoid, you know, basically the, the little thing that we have in the, in the sticker there uh, happening. And so, of course, this is something that, you know, gets you somewhere and it's an appropriate solution uh, when you have the robots operating in a factory. Um, but the fact is that a lot of the promise in modern robotics has to do with robots that go out there and operate in the world and in very, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases actually interact very closely with human beings. So this idea of the cage is not really going to um, to work in any of these scenarios. So we basically have no option but to bite the bullet and try to think about these uh, uh, multi-agent problems. And I want to say that we have had many cases of interaction failures between humans and uh, automation, whether this is in robot form or a different form. Um, and these often have to do with misunderstandings between the human component and the technological component. A uh, very good example of this, I think, uh, have been the flash crashes. The most famous one was a trillion dollar drop for a few minutes in the stock market um, in 2010. And uh, this essentially happens as a result of the poorly understood interactions between these programs that uh, folks in the uh, financial sector use called high frequency traders. And these high frequency traders are designed by uh, uh, you know, uh, programmers who have some understanding of what the, uh, what the uh, functioning of these programs is going to be. But it turns out that in fact, the interaction between them is much more complex. And in some cases really um, infrequent but really scary things can happen like what we have over here. Now, the converse of this is also relatively frequent, especially in recent cases where we're seeing uh, robotic systems being deployed in environments where they have to interact with humans. And that's where the automated component has a poor understanding of human behavior. This poor understanding having been encoded by the engineers. Um, and the picture that uh, you're looking at in particular is the uh, one of the Uber vehicles, I think this is in Tempe, Arizona, where um, the vehicle just assumed that uh, nobody was going to enter an intersection. It turns out that there was a human waiting to make a left turn, uh, a human driver in a car. And then they went ahead with the left turn. The uh, Uber vehicle approached the intersection like there was, uh, you know, like nobody was going to try anything. Then the human tried that. And uh, this is the, the state in which the Uber vehicle ended up. Fortunately, nobody was... Uh, seriously injured is my understanding. Um, but there have been other cases where, uh, unfortunately, the outcome has been more tragic. And so, especially in the context of self-driving uh, vehicles, but also in the context of any kind of robotic system that is going to be closely interacting with humans or sharing the space with humans. Um, and also in many cases when we have a, an automation system that needs to be interacting in closed loop with people, it's very important that the automation is designed with a good understanding of uh, how people are going to behave. And this leads us to kind of the final form of um, human automation failure, which is a combination of the two. When we don't have a good understanding as engineers and system designers of the interaction between the human component and the automation component. Um, and I believe all of you are familiar 
uh, with the uh, the accidents of the Boeing 737 Max models uh, a couple of years ago now, which came from uh, design of some you know safety uh, overrides that were automated and that pilots were not supposed to even notice were there. And it turns out that uh, you know kind of slipped under the swept under the rug were some assumptions about how the human pilots were going to react to a possible automation failure that ended up not being realistic at all. So um, these are these are sort of you know connected types of failure, and it's often not the case that you can uh, put something exclusively in one category. Um, but the fact is that they happen quite frequently, and in order to have systems that are truly reliable and truly safe when we deploy them out in the world, very often we need to be, be very explicitly accounting for these kinds of uh, interaction and reasoning. Everything making sense so far? Uh, if any of you have any questions or any opinions about uh, any of this, please feel free to jump in. I'll give you a few seconds because I'm going to drink a bit of water. Okay, well, I just want to show this very brief video that you've probably, uh, uh, some of you have seen, if not all of you. This is a video on YouTube called Tesla Autopilot Tried to Kill Me. And what, uh, what happens is the car is uh, supposedly driving itself and there's a vehicle approaching on the oncoming lane and suddenly the autopilot uh, beeps, beep, beep, failure and steers into the opposite lane. Uh, fortunately, the driver grabs the steering wheel just in time to prevent uh, what would have been a pretty bad uh, sort of frontal collision. So question for you, what kind of, uh, what kind of human automation failure do we have here? Is it a matter of the human not understanding how the automation works? Is it a matter of the automation not having a good model of how the human is going to behave? Is it a problem in the interaction? What do folks think? I think it's the robot model. It's the robot model of the human? Uh, no, the robot with the environment, I think. So the robot has a, a wrong model of the environment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As in uh, the robot suddenly decides that it's okay to make that, uh, that crazy uh, turn to the left. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's, that's certainly, that's certainly um, part of the problem. Um, there seems to be some kind of perception failure where the system just says like, well, I, for some reason, what I decide, I'm deciding to do now is to, to turn to the left. It turns out that uh, I believe this, I believe this may actually have been an, uh, an autopilot disengage because it actually goes beep, 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 uh, right before it, uh, it turns. Sorry that I don't have the, the audio on this video. Um, so basically the system fails and, and disengages is, is what is happening. Um, and the assumption that the company made here is that if that ever happens, well, it's not a problem because the human is taking uh, control of the vehicle because uh, human's driving all the time. The, uh, the autopilot system here is just helping the human drive. So that's actually a, an inaccurate assumption that the automation system or you know, by proxy, the engineers who designed the automation system um, is making here about the human driver. So this system says, hey, I'm just going to disengage right now. I hope that's okay. I think that's okay. Uh, but it turns out that disengaging all of a sudden uh, is not a safe thing for the system to do if there's an oncoming vehicle because the human might need a second to you know, grab the steering wheel uh, or um, ensure that, that safety is maintained. At the same time, the human actually has a bad model of the automation. Because a human who is, uh, you know, sitting back and taking a video with their smartphone is clearly not expecting that the that the autopilot could suddenly disengage just as an oncoming vehicle approaches. So Do there's I some remember, kind of. 
Mm -hmm. Do I remember correctly that like the way that Tesla was able to get away with deploying its autopilot was by making the assumption that every driver had their hands on the wheel at all times and was like ready to go? That's that's uh, indeed the case. And that's very accurate. In fact, um, in the small print of the autopilot, I believe Tesla still asks drivers to keep their hands on the wheel at all times. Of course, if you're the human user of this system, you kind of feel that doing so would sort of defeat the purpose of having the system in the first place, which is kind of um, kind of what um, what leads a lot of human users in practice to let go of the steering wheel, even though they know they shouldn't, right? And there's this there's this kind of um, relatively widespread attitude of, well, you know, you're not supposed to, but it's fine because nothing ever happens and the problem is that some things things do sometimes things do happen and then it's a bit of a of a problem right so there's uh, kind of a wrong assumption on the human's part about the competence of the system and also on the system's part about the competence of the human and usually when you have two systems that are overly relying on each other that's you know that creates a fantastic gap for something bad to sneak in um and then overall i think you can argue that there's a failure in the interaction design between the human and the automation, right? Uh, among other things, because you're not accounting for for the fact that in, in this transition of control from one to the other, there's actually a gap um, that uh, that you need to account for if you're going to think about safety. So maybe you need to, you know, kind of uh, do a reachability analysis of how long is it going to take from the disengage of the autopilot to the human actually taking over, and you know what is the what is the forward reachable set. Uh, that you're going to have for the vehicle under those conditions. And then maybe if you determine that that's safe, uh, which you probably won't, um, maybe in that case, it's okay to deploy the system as is. Um, but anyway, you know, this is one particular case of a system. I think this, this kind of shared autonomy context is very interesting because you often have this phenomenon of over-reliance, uh, which has, you know, uh, decades of uh, literature written about it uh, from the human factors literature. Um, so, okay, if folks don't have any more uh, uh, thoughts or questions of this, uh, we can move on to the sort of the, the technical meat. This is uh, very much meant to be uh, uh, an introduction to, you know, setting the tone for why these things are important. And hopefully, uh, so far, I've convinced you that, yeah, something, we, you know, we should be able to think about this in, uh, in a somewhat uh, satisfying uh, technical framework. By the way, I'm not sure if my if uh, my screen is showing up okay. I I have Sylvia, I think I have Sylvia pinned, but I'm not sure if it's just me or if it's everyone. Well, hopefully, folks are able to see me. If you're not able to see my face, just uh, complain to me, and uh, we'll we'll see about that. Okay, so we're going to talk about three uh, main sort of sub problems of um, thinking about safety around humans. First, we're going to think about uh, predicting human behavior, which is sort of an important building block if you want to make uh, reasonable decisions for your autonomous system uh, for any uh, time horizon. Then we're going to talk about how systems should reason about how much they can trust their models of human behavior. In general, any model that we have is only going to be a model, and therefore it is... Uh, susceptible to error. And that error might actually be the thing that makes or breaks your safety guarantee. So how do we get our systems to reason about the reliability of their models in a, um, you know, in a useful way? And finally, we're going to talk about planning through interactions with humans and among humans. And, um, you know, some of the challenges that come associated to that and how we can try to do things tractably. Um, although I think I, in, on this last part, I'm going to leave you with more questions than answers, which uh, means that uh, hopefully some of you will have some brilliant ideas and move the field forward. All right, so let's start off. Um, this is the kind of guiding example that we're going to have. Uh, we have a generic human being, not picking on any uh, human in particular, and we have our uh, robotic system in this case. And the goal that we have is, as we said earlier, that the robot is able to share the space with the human in a way that is safe and you know, hopefully doesn't get too much in the human's way. 
So there's a little cartoon version of that. We have the robot and the human in some space, and there might be some uh, you know, semantics of the space that allow us to reason about uh, what the human might be interested in doing. So to plan uh, the actions for the robot in a way that is safe, we'd like to make predictions about what the human is going to do. Um, in an ideal world, the robot senses the human, says, hey, there's a human over there, takes a quick look at the human and says, oh, yeah, I know what you're going to do. You're going to follow this trajectory and leave uh, the room uh, using the door. OK, excellent. So here's the robot's uh, decision based on that. Here's uh, our human uh, walking towards the identified goal. The robot makes this prediction, plans its trajectory, and now the human exactly follows the prediction, the robot exactly follows its trajectory, and so we're done. So that's basically how you do safe human-robot interaction. Except sometimes we might make the prediction for the human, and then the human might decide to do something slightly different, and then the plan that the robot had is uh, not that great anymore. And you can see how upset the human can get. Clearly, this is a human who will not want to uh, interact with that robot in the future. So, OK, what's going on here? Clearly, we forgot to do something important, which is to add some uncertainty to our predictions. Because the uh, predictions of the human, you know, it's uh, perhaps a little bit uh, too arrogant of the robot to assume that it knows exactly what the human is going to do on uh, uh, every juncture. So question uh, to all of you, what might be useful ways to model our uncertainty about what the human is going to do? What are different uncertainty models or uncertainty frameworks that we can use for this? Aha, this is what you weren't expecting. There was a quiz hidden in the in the lecture. Uh, Yu Heng wrote in the chat, GP. Oh, great. Uh, somehow I'm not seeing the, the chat because I'm sharing my screen. Let's see if I can do something about that. Yep, I got it here. OK. All right, hopefully I'll be able to see it in the future. Yeah, um, and Yu Heng is very right. One of the kinds of uh, prediction that we can that we can do is using some kind of probabilistic model where we could say, well, I don't know exactly what the human is going to do, but I can reason about how likely or unlikely different trajectories of the human can be. And so for example, a Gaussian process might be a way to do that where you say, well, the human's trajectory is a function over time. I don't know exactly what function over time we're going to see, but I can put a probability distribution over the space of possible functions. And with that, you might, you know, you might be able to um, reason about how likely it is that you're going to be in trouble if you're the robot and you choose to take this particular path. Um, what other kinds of uncertainty do we have to reason with? Anyone else? Let's see. You've been doing, a, a, I, I believe, a bit of a Hamilton, Jacoby, Isaacs type of analysis what kind of what kind of uncertainty do we tend to use there anyone we can we can just wait yeah, we can eventually just wait. they'll get uncomfortable enough worst worst case disturbances yeah, excellent. Worst case uh, disturbances, or in this case, you know, if it's a little bit um, uh, sounds a bit derogatory to to talk about the humans had disturbance, but you know, you could say worst case uh, human actions. So, yeah, right on, Nikhil. So we kind of have, uh, and and we'll talk a little bit more about this. This kind of two main frameworks to think about the uncertainty on what's going to happen. One is we consider. Um, how likely different cases are, and then we kind of weigh them by the importance or by you know their um, the the degree of confidence that we have that this thing will happen or might happen, and that's a probabilistic approach. Or we can just consider a whole set of outcomes and say, look, anything could happen within this set, so I need to make sure that um, 
you know, whatever plan I have is, is good for any of them, um, including, including the worst one, right? And that's the worst case analysis. So um, essentially for the human, we can go with either one of these two methods. So first, let's uh, talk about the worst case analysis for the human. Sometimes we refer to this as non-deterministic uncertainty, which is admittedly a bit of a um, weird name because also probabilistic uncertainty is kind of not deterministic. But anyway, here we're just saying, hey, the human has a bunch of different options available. I don't know which one they're going to take. So I'm just going to consider the set of possible human actions. And if I consider the set of possible human actions and I propagate the dynamics of the human forward with a set of actions that they might take, um, I get the forward reachable set at any given time. So here's the forward reachable set of the human after one time step. And here's the reachable set of the human, say, after four time steps. This is in cartoon form. Um, but you kind of get the idea of how this works. Now, what do you think might be an issue if we're trying to have the robot plan to avoid the forward reachable set of the human at any given point in time? So, you know, we could say, and uh, here's a, you know, kind of a version in math, at any given point, tau uh, in the future, tau greater than t, the trajectory of the robot has to stay clear of the forward reachable set of the human. Right. Or if you're thinking about sort of like the space that the human and the robot are occupying, those those footprints should not overlap at any point in the future. Right. The, I mean, this is this is on the one hand, I, I, I want to say this is great in that it gives us a really solid guarantee. If we find a plan for the robot that doesn't overlap with anywhere the human might be in the future, then we're great. Then we've found a from the safety point of view, at least, we found a trajectory that's really great for the robot because we're not going to crash with the human. What is a downside of this approach? This path might not exist. Very much so. The robot might say, hey, um, four seconds from now, or you know, 10 seconds from now, the human could be anywhere in the room. So no matter what path I choose, potentially that path is you know, eventually in collision with the human. On the one hand, the path might not exist. And on the other hand, even if you find a path that exists, maybe it's going to be a path that basically takes you, you know, kind of like all the way around um, the room so that you're safe clear of anywhere the human might possibly go over your time horizon. And so the problem with the forward reachable set is that it kind of grows over time, right? If you think of where the human could be one second from now, it's not too bad, but 10 seconds from now, it might be a real issue. And so this can be a very conservative approach. Um, so then we find ourselves in this kind of situation where we say, well, um, do we want to be that conservative? Now, there are basically two ways of going around this. One is you could do, you could account for your ability to observe the human in the future and do more of what's called a closed loop analysis. Um, and at this time, we'll talk a little bit about that. But the other thing that you can do is basically say, well, yes, but not all future possible states of the human are made equal because based on the behavior that I'm observing from the humans so far, I can probably make an educated guess as to roughly where they're going to go and where they're almost surely not going to go. And that leads us to this idea of uh, noisily rational humans and probabilistic predictions of uh, human actions. And so this idea of the noisily rational human, you know, kind of makes sense from the common sense point of view, which is, I'm not going to tell you that the human is absolutely going to do something, but I'm going to tell you that the human is likelier to take useful actions than unuseful actions. And in particular, we have this uh, model called the Boltzmann policy, which says that the human is exponentially more likely to take useful actions, uh, the more useful these actions are, right? And that's, uh, that's what we have here in the thought bubble of the robot. Um, so does this make sense? This is this is something that um, that has been used for a while in uh, you know in cognitive science and in econometrics, um, and that's been recently picked up by the robotics and autonomous systems literature, and it's actually a, a pretty common a pretty common technique at this point, or a pretty common model, a way to model human actions. You know, the, it's 
simplifying a lot of things, of course, by just saying, well, you know, this is likely this other thing. Um, it's not a model that goes into the details of, I believe you've uh, looked a little bit at levels of analysis. So this doesn't go into the possible biases that humans might have. It doesn't necessarily model uh, things like, you know, delay that the human might have in processing. It certainly doesn't go into the implementation level where, you know, the human's neurons are firing in a particular way. Um, but it does a trick in many cases at, uh, you know, getting the robot to make reasonably good predictions. Now, if you look at the at the math that we've got uh, here on the slide, you'll see that we're saying, well, this is you know exponentially likely uh, uh, with, and if you look at the exponent, we have the Q function, which is uh, the state action value function. For those of you who are familiar with, for example, reinforcement learning, you may have seen this before, uh, but basically this is just a function that's saying, hey, from the current state X, this is how good you can expect action U sub H to be. And I have this kind of uh, semicolon theta. And here theta is just some parameter that is describing what we think the human subjective is. What is a human trying to do? And so very quickly, I just want to say that um, this, this objective uh, inference can be quite important. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. So here, for example, if we assume that the human's theta is saying the human wants to leave the room, uh, then the probability distribution that we're going to have is going to look something like this. The human is you know, likely to move more or less you know, efficiently towards the door, less likely to take a detour, uh, but still you know, not as unlikely as moving in the opposite direction. Um, and in fact, we can, we can reason about the goals of the human um, in real time. So I don't really have uh, a, a picture here on the slide, but suppose that there are two doors, so there's a door and a window and a table. So we can actually keep track of how likely the human is to ultimately want to go to the door, given the last action that we just saw, right? And we can sort of do this, uh, we can update this belief at every time step um, by applying what's known as uh, Bayes' rule. Does, uh, does that make sense? And this is a, ni a nice way to make our model more useful, right? Because if we only had a model that only works when the human is trying to do exactly this one thing, uh, then very quickly that model is going to start not working well. But if we have maybe a list of possible goals that the human might go to in a certain room, then as long as we're able to, in real time, uh, adapt our belief that the human is doing one versus the other, we can get a reasonable probabilistic prediction. Okay, so going back to our little picture here, now we have this probability distribution of where the human is going to go. So now we can require the trajectory of the robot to what exactly? Because it was easier before when we just said, hey, just stay clear of anywhere the human might be. But now we have this kind of you know, soft and squishy representation of where the human might be, how likely or unlikely the human is to be there in the future. Um, you know, so it's kind of less clear what we what we should ask the robot to do about it now that makes sense any thoughts on what might be a reasonable thing to ask the robot to do to direct the robot to a trajectory that's going to the region that have a low probability of human design some community calls along the future prediction uh, trajectories yeah yeah, exactly. That sounds that sounds very reasonable, right? We can ask the robot to stay clear of high probability regions and try to stay as much as possible in the low probability regions. Um, and so, you know, you can do this basically, you can sort of try to minimize the amount of probability or you can set a threshold and say, hey, you're allowed to be in regions that have probability after, you know, depending on your application, you could be comfortable with 1%, you could be comfortable with 0.1% percent or you could be comfortable with 10 percent again this is only for the plan right you, you're you will be able to replan in the future but but now this allows you to say hey this kind of uh, trajectory for the robot might get the robot in trouble in the future so let's if possible take um a uh, trajectory with less of a chance of getting the robot in trouble all right great so that's a question that i just asked you and um you know, a way in which you can sort of uh, visualize what, 
we're asking the robot to do is here's a human at time t and here's the robot at time t and now the robot is going to plan a trajectory using your favorite trajectory planning method and reason about some future time uh, tau and where the robot might be at that future time and now here's the human's probability distribution at that future time and we have this distribution, there's different ways in which you can represent it. Sometimes you can just put a Gaussian distribution around a certain point. Uh, in other cases, you might want to use a sort of a grid over the state space and just, you know, put different amounts of probability in each grid cell. Um, and now, uh, so, you know, this probability of the humans uh, of the human state at time tau, given uh, what we know about the human at time t. So now one thing that you can do is to say, well, this is the set of states where the robot might be. I know that some of you, uh, well, I know that all of you at this point have seen some of the techniques for um, robust trajectory uh, tracking. So suppose that the robot is running, say, fast track. And here we have this tracking error bound where the robot says, well, you know, I'm going to try to be exactly at point XR, but I know that I'm going to be somewhere around it. So here's my bounding box of where I might be. Now, the question to ask is, well, if I'm going to be anywhere in this box, how much probability of the human am I intersecting with? Because um, that probability of the human that I'm intersecting with uh, here for this bounding box is the probability that I'm going to have a crash with the human, provided that I follow this trajectory. And then, you know, doing this worst case assumption of I will be anywhere or everywhere within this box, right? So this can be now the criterion that we use to say, hey, this is the probability that the robot's gonna crash with the human if it goes to that state. Um, and we can determine is this probability sufficiently low or is it too high? Um, so going, any questions on, on this picture? Okay, I wanna make sure things are making, things are making sense. So here's a requirement. For example, we say, okay, Probability cannot be greater than delta at any given time step. So then the human uh, follows the trajectory, the robot has stayed out of trouble, and so everyone is happy. So you might think that we're done with this, um, but as we were saying, there's a little bit of a problem even with these models, which is that even if your uncertainty is now you know, accounted for and is probabilistic, you still have a model of that uncertainty. And this uncertainty model is still, you know, predicated on the assumption that the human is going to say, in this case, leave the room by walking roughly efficiently towards the door. But, you know, if we rewind and go back to where we were and we run this again, here's another possible realization of, uh, of the human's motion. Human's leaving the room, but a bee flies into the room, the human runs away, boom, and we have a collision with the robot. And the problem with this is that we didn't, you know, as engineers, we didn't explicitly encode into the robot the possibility that certainly a bee was going to fly into the room, he was going to run away. Um, I think it's fair to say that robots, uh, most of these robots don't have the sensors to actually detect a uh, small insect flying into the room. Even if they did, most robots don't really have the ability to quite grasp the subtle relationship between humans and bees. So ultimately, there's a good chance that something like this can be uh, can end up driving the behavior of the human and yet not being accounted for in the model. So then what do we do about this? And this is kind of, you know, this is a question that, um, that uh, might bother you if at any point you're trying to use a, any kind of model of human behavior to reason about safety. Uh, so here's kind of the, the actual, the, the way this uh, plays out in, in a, an actual example, this is uh, an actual trajectory of a human that we're recording and the predictions between two known goals. You can see that the predictions change between one goal and the other and the robot's following its trajectory from A to B. And now the human starts walking towards an unmodeled goal and the robot ends up getting too close to the human. And if you look at the predictions that the robot has been making, the predictions of the robot are actually not at all reasonable because the human is doing something that does not suggest that the human is moving towards either of the two goals. But because the robot lives in this, um, in this particular case, in this closed universe where anything that the human is doing must be explained by you know, goal one or goal two, 
then it's not able to acknowledge that right now the human's behavior is not really matching the model. It's not really being captured by the model. Now, you know, you can argue that we should just add an additional goal and then we're done. But the, you know, the point here is uh, a little bit more philosophical, which is that no matter how impressive your model is, it can always be something that the human is doing that you fail to capture in your model. It doesn't matter how many layers you put in your neural network, this can still happen. Um, so, you know, this, this requirement turned out not to, be, not to be met because our model wasn't really uh, accounting for everything. So even probabilistic guarantees are only as good as the model they're based on and modeling error is inevitable, especially if you're dealing with humans. Okay, so this leads us to part two, which is what do we do about this? How can we have the robot reasonably uh, detect and acknowledge when its models are not working very well? Any questions so far? Uh, I had I had one question. So I guess, yeah. what were your thoughts on um, like using this sort of predictive approach versus uh, maybe not relying so heavily on prediction, relying more on rapid replanning or that sort of an approach? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, I think the answer is that in reality, you need both. Um, and here's why. You can have a system that is great at reactive replanning, but if you're not accounting for what the human is going to do, or at least what the human is likely going to do, you might find that you end up relying on this, on this replanning, especially on, on sort of emergency maneuvers a lot of the time. And so from the point of view of efficiency, and if you think, for example, of a self-driving car, um, this, can be, this can be a serious issue. You'd be you know, very frequently relying on these overrides for safety. And uh, basically you would have a, a very jittery autonomous system that is permanently saying, no, not this. Oh, no, not this, because you're, you're, uh, uh, you're uh, reacting a lot. And so the way to smooth out the reacting and reduce the need to uh, drastically change your your behavior very frequently is to you know smooth it out with uh, with planning by reasoning about what's going to happen. On the other hand, you absolutely need to replan, right? And part of um, part of what I'm kind of like sweeping under the rug here is that in general, in these uh, approaches that I'm showing, the robot is not explicitly accounting for its ability to replan in the future. So for now, it's just saying, well, I want to have a plan that will last for at least this finite horizon and that will very likely not get in trouble for the duration of the horizon. In practice, and you know, this is kind of the, the model predictive control paradigm, and in practice it works pretty well, among other things, because in practice we are replanning relatively frequently. So we never really get to execute the entirety of the plan, right? We only execute the first few steps of the plan, and then we replan and we update things uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. um, now, in an ideal world, what you want to have is a robot that has both planning and reacting, uh, including the ability to replan, and in addition, has the ability to bank on this fact and plan to replan, if that makes sense. So you want to have a system that says, hey, I'm going to have a plan that works for now, but I know that when I make some new observation, I'm going to be able to decide if I go left or right, depending on you know what happens then. So basically a robot that has this kind of philosophy of we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And that's essentially the difference between a plan and a policy um, with the caveat that in practice very often it's, it's uh, computationally challenging to plan for all the different you know, uh, conditional replans that you will have in the future. Did that uh, at least yeah, yeah. address the question? Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Oh, All right, yeah, Jaime. Um, yeah, Sylvia. So you're you're a generic human in this case. She seems very fixated on getting to her goal and not uh, responding mm -hmm. to the robot. And we've seen lots of you know videos of uh, like either the human getting out of the way of the robot and making the robot's job mm -hmm. easier, or like that that um. Japanese mall robot video that you and I love of the children that like purposely terrorize a robot that's just trying to do its job. Uh, so how do you deal with the fact that like humans are aware of a robot in the environment? Yeah, that's uh, that's 
I mean, that's that? a great part question. <laughs> well, I hope that we'll get to address a little bit of that in part three. But mm -hmm. I think that uh, there are sort of two parts to the question, or at least two parts to the answer. A uh, part of it is that many of the ways in which the humans do react to the robot are often uh, uh, beneficial to the robot's plans. In other words, if a human actually turns out uh, uh, to get out of the way of the robot, then that makes the robot's life easier because then there's less of a chance of a collision and less of a chance of a conflict. You can argue that it doesn't hurt safety if the robot is planning under the assumption that uh, the human will not get out of the way. That way, if the human, uh, in the case where the human, for example, is not uh, aware of the robot or not paying attention to the robot, we won't get into trouble because we weren't relying, we weren't putting much of the burden of safety on the human. Uh, but still, when the human does get out of the way, the robot says, oh, great, that's even better. Uh, you can argue that then there's, an, you know, basically what you're doing is you're taking a cost in terms of efficiency because the robot could have accounted for that and maybe, you know, given the human uh, a little bit less birth and it would have been fine. Um, now, the case of the kids that terrorize the robot is a little bit different, right? Because then the humans sometimes can actually be adversarial and assuming that the human is just leaving you alone and ignoring you in this case is not a conservative assumption anymore, but it's an optimistic assumption compared to reality. And so in those cases, um, it's a little bit uh, less uh, obvious that this is a good strategy. However, as Nikhil was saying, you can always rely on this sort of last, uh, last resort of safety, which is, hey, we can still replan and we can still react, right? So in this example, for example, um, in this example that we have with the human the generic human who ends up having the collision with the robot, uh, the robot basically gets to this point where it gives up and it just keeps following its previous plan because it's not able to replan and find a better thing to do. Uh, but you can easily argue that, well, you know, if you put a little uh, PID controller on the robot that says, hey, just like, you know, move away from anything that seems like a solid object right in front of you, um, you would at least prevent the immediate collision, right? So. It's a combination of things, but I ultimately what we're trying to do, at least in this context, is try to get the robot um, out of trouble with uh, with high probability so that we're not putting all of the burden on safety on some sort of last resort mechanism that just you know banks on the physics of, well, but my crazy fly can do a faster maneuver than most you know walking human speeds. So we're fine. But yeah. Very good. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know this the, this uh, second element here. How do we have the robots uh, you know get confused, get appropriately confused about what the human is doing? So because it's difficult to organize experiments with actual bees in the lab, we decided instead to spill some coffee, and uh, to avoid having to mop it up later, we actually used uh, fake coffee. But you can see that here our human is maneuvering around this. Uh, this obstacle, and as we actually just said, uh, the planner ends up failing. So I'm going to play this video again, and I want you to pay attention to what's happening on the right side of the screen, where you'll see that the quadcopter is just you know, going straight down towards its goal. And it has some model of where the human is going to try to go. And even though the human starts deviating from the uh, initially predicted trajectory, the robot keeps very confidently predicting that at the very immediate step, the human is going to turn and go straight to the goal. So if you look at sort of, you know, the direction the predictions point in, the robot gets overconfident, not realizing that the human is just doing something else, is continuing to avoid some obstacle that the robot has no idea about. Um, and so eventually it gets to a point where the planner just gives up and says, hey, I, I don't know what happened. I thought there wasn't going to be a human, but now there is a human and my previous plan doesn't work and all of my new plans seem to also not work. So I quit. Um, so, all right, how do, we, how do we prevent this kind of situation from arising? What you can argue here is that, well, the robot kind of had information already that the human was not following the model. So couldn't the robot have you know, use that information to say, if my model wasn't working so great for the last two seconds, it's probably not going to work very well for the next two seconds. And so, 
you know, essentially the idea here is we don't want to blame the human for deviating from our model and say, hey, human, behave yourself, go back to following my model. But rather we want to start becoming skeptical um, uh, of our model's accuracy. So in general, this is kind of the, the picture that uh, I think it's useful to paint often. Uh, uh, the gap, the reality gap between the models that we have and the reality to which we're trying to apply these models. And this gap is actually very important for safety because uh, you could have a system that's perfectly safe on the yellow side of the gap, but it turns out not to work on the white side of the gap. So you want to um, you want to make sure that you're accounting for the possibility that reality, whether it comes in the form of beast coffee spills or any form of unmodeled intent or behavior of the human, um, will you'll ha your robot will have some way to acknowledge any discrepancies between between what's really happening and what its model was predicting would happen. Okay, so let's look at one possible way to bridge the gap. Uh, and in the case of Boltzmann models, which as we said, have been used quite a bit, there's actually one parameter that's pretty useful for that. And this is what's called beta over here. Uh, which uh, in terms of the Boltzmann distribution is what's usually called the inverse temperature parameter. So this is a parameter that um, if you look at the equation above, as it goes to infinity, it makes the distribution very, very sharp around the optimal action because essentially that optimal action gets multiplied by a very large number put in the exponential and it becomes much, much better, the exponential of that value becomes much, much larger than the exponential of any of the smaller values. Um, and similar as beta goes to zero, then that difference becomes less and less relevant uh, in the exponential. And ultimately, all actions end up looking the same. If beta is actually equal to zero, then all of these things have exactly this. All of these uh, uh, options for the human have exactly the same, the same value, the same probability. Um, so, you know, this term is sometimes called the rationality coefficient because it tells you how rational the human is with respect to your model. Um, it's a little bit unfair to the human because as we said, when the human deviates from your model, it's typically not because they're irrational, it's typically because your model is missing something important. Um, but okay, so, you know, the, the, the question here is, can we actually take this, uh, this beta parameter into our model and instead of just treating it like a fixed constant, actually reason about it in the same way that we reason about theta uh, in terms of you know, you know where we think the human is going to go. So now we can ask these two questions. What particular goal do I think the human is trying to get to, but also how confident am I that the human is even following any other goals predicted by my model? And so you can actually do a similar Bayesian update so that when the human is starting to do something that is not agreeing with your model, your robot can say, aha, well, how likely is the human to be accurately following my model, beta, given the action u that I just saw them take? And if the actions that the human is taking don't seem to make a lot of sense for the model, then it's probably because the model is missing something important. And so, uh, you know, we have this kind of distribution, this probability over the different values of beta. We could do this, you know, by discretizing uh, different values, some very low, some very high. Uh, in some cases, you could think of doing it with some kind of continuous distribution whose parameters you're updating. But in any case, once you have this updated uh, uh, probability distribution over uh, beta, that leads to an updated probability distribution about what the human is going to do in the future, uh, which is what we're representing here with the larger disk. And now the robot can say, oh, I'm not going to get too close to the human when I'm not sure what the human is going to do. So that kind of makes... Um, you know, it makes sense uh, intuitively, um, and it turns out to work well in practice. So here's the same video that I showed you earlier where the human is going from one goal to the other goal, and then ends up going to a third goal that the robot knows nothing about. And so the robot gets in trouble if it's just assuming that the human will continue to follow the model very well. Instead, if we use this idea of the Bayesian confidence, you can see that for a moment when the human stops at the goal, the robot doesn't know very well. It becomes a bit more uncertain. But most importantly, now that the human starts going to a third goal, the robot very quickly says, I have no idea what this person is trying to do. The human has a larger cloud of probability around them. The robot decides to give them a little bit more space um, 
and as a result, remain safe. Okay, so here's um, a similar video, but not without the ominous music. And this gives you a bit of an idea of how it works. The robot is planning its path. The human starts doing something strange and you immediately see how the robot is saying, uh, uh nope, I'm getting out of the way. Boom, gives the human a little bit extra space and avoids a collision. And this is happening, um, you know, as Nikhil was saying, the robot is replanning, making a new observation, becoming less confident in this case and uh, planning a new trajectory. But what's nice is that it's not leaving it for the very last moment, right? It's already saying, huh, I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to be cautious ahead of time and try not to get in trouble because I think this human is doing something a little bit strange. All right. Um, any uh, questions or complaints at this point? Uh, I had another question, sorry. So uh, in, no, in regards to these, like uh, modeling these humans, um, what are you like how, how do you deal with kind of scalability issues let's say you're in a crowd of like a thousand humans or let's say um let's say you haven't modeled something but you would counter it like i'm in a crowd of humans and then suddenly i'm in a crowd of birds so i don't know like how they're going to behave or something that you know mm -hmm. will not act similar to like just a moving obstacle yeah i mean that's a that's a great question so the first part of the question i would say hang on a moment because it's coming right up uh with the crowd of humans but in the case of suddenly having birds well you know this uh there's usually only so much that you can do in terms of you know the physics aren't even the same you know if you have a uh if you have a model of your um quadcopter uh and you know that there can be a little bit of disturbance around it you can bound that, that disturbance and still have some safety guarantees but if i now replace the quadcopter by a tricycle uh, and I, you know, drop you there in the middle of, uh, uh, as you know, whatever, a uh, hundred feet over the ground, then probably you can't give any safety guarantees anymore, right? So, mm -hmm. of course, there are certain certain things that you want to be able to do very well. But still, if you replace a human by a bird, and the bird is moving in a way that makes no sense to your model, given what you know about the human, at least this kind of approach would very quickly, uh, you know, take that out and say this, you know. This human doesn't seem like the typical human that I'm used to predicting, um, if that makes sense. And at least you would increase your uncertainty. Um, but I want to make a, a brief point here, which is here we are dealing with the uncertainty over the human's decisions, which is kind of, you know, uncertainty about the human's cognitive decision making. Mm -hmm. um, you can relatively well separate that uncertainty from your uncertainty about the physical dynamics of the particular object uh, whose motion you're trying to predict. So if you think that you have a human, but in fact you have a bird, you're probably not expecting the human to fly around uh, and go anywhere. If the bird starts you know, flying out, then that's not something that's only about the decisions anymore. It's about the physics. Um, so you can often treat that differently. And so it's worth just pointing out here that even if the human could make any decisions um, within a certain range, we're still assuming, for example, that their velocity is bounded, right? So if you mm -hmm. replace a human with, uh, you know, with a fighter jet, then the problem that you're going to have is not that you're getting the, the, the decisions wrong, it's that you're getting the velocity wrong by several orders of magnitude. Or, or let's say like the uh, human has a fan and can like blow air or something like that. Things like, mm -hmm. things like, uh, would you just uh, bunch that in with like uh, unexpected dynamics or? I think I think when it when it comes to physical differences in the model, it's usually more useful to think of them as uh, error in your physical dynamics, okay. rather than error in the decisions of the of the agent. But there are cases where it's kind of coupled, right? Like if this happens mm -hmm. to be a human who's running after you with a with a hair dryer or something or a bigger <laughs> fan, then it's a, it's a different, it's a combination of the two. Yeah. Um, I, a, a couple more thoughts related to that. So. Uh, First, I think in, in general, there's this interesting question of when should you be confused versus when should you actually update your model? Like when is when is it just a this random human with a fan weirdly blowing on you versus when is like this a, a thing about what humans do that humans carry around fans and point them at you and you need to incorporate that into your model and your prediction. Um, another thing on the like uncertain physical dynamics that I remember in this experiment is that we had one person, one of our human subjects, 
who skips everywhere he goes, like does not walk. He like bounces when he's like going down the hallway and stuff. And so he is not exactly a bird, but he is now moving in 3D, like rather than our two dimensional dot that we had of humans, we had like a three dimensional person who was like bouncing around the room. Uh, and our, our algorithm was able to like deal with this better than before in terms of being confused, which is probably the, a good thing to be in this case. Uh, but again, it would be interesting to ask when, when is it worth now switching into reasoning in 3D versus sticking to 2D? And then last uh, quick question for Jaime. It also made me think of, I, I think I remember hearing this, but I, I'm curious if, if you can confirm this after working at Waymo, um, that in the self-driving car arena, in terms of prediction, one of the hardest ones is uh, bicycles. Like the difference between reasoning about a human pedestrian versus a human on a bicycle is very different in terms of the challenges that you have. So again, yeah, ab sure. absolutely. And there's another uh, more recent challenge that is um, uh, motorized pedestrians, uh, or uh, I believe informally sometimes they're called turbopeds. So these are people who are riding an electric unicycle, for example, or uh, who are on a hoverboard or something like that, and they look like humans to a you know to a reasonably good perception system. You say, oh, that's a human, and suddenly this human goes and just zooms forward at you know three times the speed you would have expected, and so that can be quite um, quite a. You're challenging. one of those people, right, Jaime? Uh, yes, unfortunately for self driving car companies, I am one of those people who sometimes uh, zooms around in an electric unicycle. So it's actually so. First, it's actually interesting. These uh, these are categories, types of agent that these companies account for because they need to account for. Uh, but, you know, we've been talking about this theta as being something that just changes the uh, type of intent of the human. But you very much could have, uh, you know, just just as well, another uh, theta that uh, tells you the type of agent that you have. So instead of saying, oh, I'm uncertain whether this human wants to go straight or turn right, you can say, I'm uncertain whether this human has legs or wheels. And depending on which it is, I'm going to make a different kind of prediction about how this human is going to move. So yes, I mean, that's uh, absolutely, absolutely on point. All right, let's, uh, I wanna make sure, you know, uh, we don't run out of time before uh, talking a little bit about interaction. So this is just a zoomed in version of the robot getting out of the way. Okay. How do we deal with uh, interactions? Now, there's actually multiple, you know, this is a very tricky question. So it has multiple, um, I think, sub questions associated to it. Uh, but I want to make sure we uh, talk about the question that Nikhil just asked, which is what happens when we have multiple humans, not just one human, and we want to predict where they're going to go. Um, and then talk a little bit about what happens when humans actually what they do will depend on what the robot does right because that's a very important question too um because then you have these kind of self-fulfilling or self-defeating prophecies where you know I, I was gonna go but then you went but then you didn't go because you saw me planning to go and so then and so then what happens um so first here's the same picture that we that we had before but now we don't have one human we have two humans and so ideally, we'd like to make some prediction about jointly what the two humans are going to do. Maybe they're going to sort of avoid each other uh, and each one go to their um, you know, most likely destination based on what we've been uh, observing so far. Um, but the problem is that when the robot is reasoning about uh, these humans, let's, you know, let's see what happens. In this toy problem, assume that we have discretized the state space for the human into 1,000 possible states. So for two humans, we need to reason about you know, the combination of this human is going to be here while this human is going to be there. And these, the combination matters because if humans react to each other, then they will react, they will take a different action from the same position for them, depending on where the other human is. So we really do need to think about the combination. So then for two humans, we have 1 million, which you know it's fine perhaps for a reasonably big computer. Now the problem is that for three humans, now we have a billion. And for four humans, we have a trillion. So at some point here, we went from something that gets computed in fractions of a second to something that gets computed in minutes or days. 
And as you approach four or five humans, it can be something that gets computed in years, even if you have a computing cluster uh, to take care of this for you. So that's not great. And this is what is normally known as a curse of dimensionality, which is the exponential growth of computation, both in terms of you know, uh, CPU time and in terms of the memory that you need to even store this probability distribution that you're trying to maintain. So this is not going to scale great. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't try it. We could maybe sometimes break it down into interactions between two agents, maybe between three agents, if we're lucky and we can, uh, and we can afford to do these computations. Or maybe we find some clever way of uh, representing these trajectories without needing a grid. Um, but in general, this is a challenging problem, right? And so one thing that you can do, and that's sort of the, the first thing that is worth noting is, well, to some extent, or at least in some scenarios, interactions between human might not be huge deviations from what they were going to do if they were acting alone. And so we could kind of think of them as disturbances or as you know small modeling errors. So can we get away with just ignoring interactivity altogether and just think of each human as though they're alone, which is way cheaper to do, right? Because then you just do n computations for the n humans. Um, and instead of exponential, you have linear scalability and it's parallel, so you can do them all at the same time. Uh, and then we just absorb any interactions that do happen as deviations from the model. So here's the picture of how that looks. Each human just, you know, plans to walk through the other human if needed. The other human is not even there. And then the robot starts planning its motion and suddenly the humans deviate from that prediction. And then the robot says, uh, okay, these humans for some reason are not behaving uh, according to my model. They're not well-behaved humans who just walk through anything that gets in their way. So I'm going to become more uncertain about them for as long as they're doing the weird thing. And then once the humans end their interaction, go back to normal, uh, the robot can get confident again and say, okay, yeah, no, no, things are working. And here I go finishing my trajectory. So that's the, that's the idea, or that's the hope. Does that make sense? So far? Okay, so this is, um, that was the idea. And we actually wanted to try just, you know, how much we could get away with. So we actually, um, uh, we actually went and did it. But before showing you what we did, I want to add that you can actually do this with not only multiple humans, but also multiple robots. So you can say, well, here are the trajectories for our three robots, one, two, and three. I'm going to reason about these trajectories in some kind of a discrete way. If you're using fast track, now each robot has a tracking error bound around them, and I'm just going to plan trajectories so that the error bounds don't bump into each other. And so now we have potentially multiple drones avoiding each other while avoiding humans who could or could not be uh, interacting with each other and or with the drones. So now we're really trying to go at this much more general problem and uh, you know, and see what happens if we're just trying to absorb all interactions with this uh, simplified version of reality. So here are two also generic humans, uh, no two humans in particular, um, and we're going to play this video twice. These uh, slides are actually made uh, quite masterfully by Sylvia, um, who somehow also uh, knew these two humans. And here's what happens. So first look at the main, uh, main video, uh, the large video on the screen. So there's the two drones, the humans are moving around. Oops, they interact with each other. And the drones, still move around somehow they're able to make it to their destinations which are the two dots marked in blue there's one and here's the other one great why is that human done. dancing yeah who knows some humans are just less rational than others uh as it turns out so sometimes they deviate from any reasonable model <laughs> so indeed one of the humans is dancing and you can uh in fact notice now i'm going to play the video again um and take a look at the uncertainty that the humans have around them as the robots are navigating. Uh, you'll see that one of the humans actually has a little bit more uncertainty around them because they're not moving uh, entirely uh, purposefully. Uh, and you'll see also that the uncertainty around the human grows once they start interacting. So here's the uh, video in question. So if you're looking at the two drones, they are going to start planning now. And there you go. 
here are the humans interacting and here they are going back to their goals. So you can see that once they're done with the interaction, you have a more purple high probability path. And when they're interacting, um, well, even once they're stopped, the human who's still moving has a bigger cloud because the human's actually not stopped. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, it's a small proof of concept, but you can see how uh, to some extent you can get away without modeling the interaction in some cases, which is great. It's great news. That's, you know, easy peasy. If all interactions are like that, then we can just not worry about interactions at all. Now, the problem is that sometimes we actually need the interaction because sometimes we might not be able to find a solution unless we account for the fact that humans might interact with each other or with us. So specifically, for example, in the case of self-driving cars, often it's useful to actively plan to influence human behavior. So going back to our cartoon from the beginning, what's happening here is the robot's thinking about the human but the human is also thinking about the robot. So it kind of makes sense that the human in the robot's bubble has a little bubble in turn that contains the robot, right? So kind of the human, the, the robot is doing the sort of, you know, one level reasoning where, it, where it's saying, well, I'm going to assume that you're just thinking of what I'm going to do and somehow trying to predict me and I'm going to take actions so that when you predict me, you'll get out of my way or you're, you know, you'll find a trajectory that's consistent with me. Um, so you can think about this uh, in the context of sort of nested trajectory optimization or iterated, in some cases, trajectory optimization. It's, um, we can talk about that in a moment. It's not exactly the same, but they're kind of the two are related. So here's, here, I have A here for autonomous car. Um, the, um, the overall cost, the return that the robot's trying to maximize is this sum of costs or sum of rewards over time that depend on uh, the state, which is the joint state of the two agents, and then the actions taken by uh, the robot car and possibly also by the human. If the robot, for example, um, have some kind of courtesy cost and wants to make sure that the human doesn't have to do extreme maneuvers. So here we have the robot car in yellow, the robot car considers a bunch of different trajectories, but also we have the human, the human car. And so the human car also has multiple trajectories that they could choose from. So what these methods do is they say, well, if the robot expects the human to predict what the robot's going to do, then basically the human is solving an optimization problem for every possible robot trajectory. So the robot says, hey, this is my trajectory. If you're able to predict it, then go ahead and optimize your own trajectory. Let me look at what comes out. And if I like that, then I pick that trajectory. Otherwise I pick a different trajectory. Um, so, you know, in this example, we fix the robot trajectory. We let the human optimize the robot trajectory. Sorry, the human optimize their own trajectory. Um, and then maybe after we've done that, we fix that trajectory, switch gears and have the robot optimize its trajectory, keeping the human's trajectory fixed. Now, Depending on whether we're doing this in a nested structure or in a back and forth iterative structure, that just changes, you know, who's optimizing at what times. In the nested version, basically the human optimizes much more frequently in an inner loop. So the robot says, hey, I changed my trajectory a little bit. And the human says, okay, okay, let me find the optimal trajectory for that. And then the robot says, I'm going to change it a bit more. And then the human says, okay, let me find the optimal version for that. Whereas in the iterated version, the robot says, I'm going to change it a bit. And the human says, well, I'm going to change it a bit. And then the robot says, I'm going to change it a bit. And then the human says, I'm going to change it another bit. But ultimately, these two methods do the same thing, which is both agents are optimizing at any given time, assuming that the other agent's trajectory is being fixed. That makes sense? It turns out that these games work reasonably well in, um, in a few different cases. You might ask the question about whether these methods converge to something. And it turns out that the answer is no in the general case. So in general, there's no reason to assume that we're not going to be going in circles where the human says, you know, in trajectory space, the human says, I'm here, the robot says, I'm here. And then the human moves like that, the robot moves like that, the human moves like that, the robot moves like that, and they end up going like in a circle in trajectory space. Um, but in some cases with some reasonable assumptions that you can make about separating the costs, you actually have some kind of okay uh, near convergence guarantees. Um, but it's not entirely the full way we'd like to reason about this. And the reason is that uh, we're assuming that the human has this 
magical ability to predict the robot's entire trajectory and even to do it in this kind of optimization loop where, oh, the robot proposes a bunch of different trajectories and the human has somehow the ability to respond to each one of those with perfect um, foresight of what's going to happen. So it's not a very realistic um, method. And in fact, sometimes it ends up with the robot being overly aggressive because the robot just assumes that the human is going to get out of the way. When in reality, the human cannot know at time one that the robot's going to be doing some you know, weird aggressive thing at time five. So in practice, the human won't make space for the robot. Um, so instead, ideally what we'd like to do is actually you know, complete this picture a little bit more and say, well, okay, the human has a picture of the robot, which means the robot can influence the human. But similarly, the human will expect the robot to also be reasoning about the human so we actually, you know, we need to add more bubbles. And in fact, we need to add, you know, an infinite number of bubbles nested back and forth where the human thinks about what the robot thinks, the human thinks, the robot will think she thinks it thinks, which is not going to end um, anytime soon. And you have this kind of infinite regress. Fortunately, there's a mathematical way to think about this, which is um, game theory. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we won't be able to get into all the details of game theoretic planning. Um, but I did want to end uh, I, want, I wanted to make sure that we got to this point, uh, which is an example that I think is actually quite uh, uh, quite surprising because it shows you just how good humans are at coordinating uh, with each other and finding equilibria um, that are sometimes not even obvious to mathematical models. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a coordination game between all of us. So we're all on the same team. We all want to win the game. And the way we're going to hopefully win the game is if we all choose the same option out of two options, heads or tails. So we're going to have a, a quick poll here, but now this is what you need to be thinking about. Ideally, we're all going to pick the same thing. So you would need to think about what other people are likelier to pick and you're, you know, Try, try to coordinate somehow implicitly because we're, we're not really having a chance to think about this. So I'm going to shut up now and let everyone go. And we'll see. Okay. So everyone's gone. And here are the results. Um, so it's actually quite remarkable that we have almost perfect coordination. Uh, by the way, nobody, you know, don't feel bad if you're the person who selected tails. There's actually, um, it, you know, it, this is a noisy experiment. And it actually turns out that uh, people can sometimes select tails for different reasons. But I think what probably made the majority of you uh, pick tails, uh, sorry, pick heads, is that there's kind of this, this feeling that somehow heads, maybe because it comes first, has a, maybe because it's like the typical, you know, picture of a coin that gets shown. It's a little bit more salient, and there's like a tiny, tiny epsilon of probability that you know a human would pick heads over tails. But then the magic happens, which is everybody says, "Well, if other people are thinking the same thing I'm thinking, that means they're totally going to pick heads." Which means I absolutely have to pick heads. So you go from this tiny epsilon of yeah, maybe a little bit more to a sort of pretty strong uh, incentive to pick heads. And so what's interesting about that is that. Um, you know, people are actually really good at coordinating with each other, even without having agreed on anything explicitly. And ultimately, this is something that robots uh, and autonomous systems can and should tap into in order to um, in order to uh, uh, preserve safety around humans. So anyway, with that, I let's see if I'm able to. Uh, switch to the last slide. This might not be a thing that I'm that I'm able to do. Uh, oh, yes. OK, great. So I, I had some bonus slides here that I'm going to skip. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to leave, uh, leave my email there in case anybody wants to uh, ask me questions or send me any uh, complaints about anything that didn't make sense in the lecture. But anyway, um, hopefully this leaves you with a little bit of the intrigue on you know how do we get autonomous systems to be able to do this magical thing 
that humans are somehow able to do and reason about interacting uh, with each other. All right, great. I don't know if we have any, you know, uh, probably some folks need to peel off. I uh, personally don't have anywhere to be urgently. So if anybody wants to hang, uh, you know, hang on behind and ask any uh, extra questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Okay, great. Right, thank, thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, all right, yeah, if you got to get going, go ahead and, and go. Uh, if you have more questions for Jaime, I know some of you had questions about game theory and stuff that we maybe didn't get to. Uh, please go ahead and ask. Great. Yeah, we can leave on the recording so that folks can uh, uh, maybe watch it later if they're sure. interested. Hi. Um, I do you mind? Uh, let, let me phrase my question. So the the behavior you just described with the heads and tails, I think it's called shelling point or something like that. Absolutely. It's yeah, called yeah, a yeah. shelling point. Um, is there any way that we could achieve it computationally? Because I know um, there have been some uh, work in this for, for natural language processing where they, they do it statistically in some sense. And mm -hmm. then if that doesn't work, they try to encode it and call it common sense in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, do you see um, like a human made knowledge graph used in this case, or do you see it? Do you think it could be computed statistically? Yeah, so that's a, I mean, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, it's a research question. I don't think that there is, you know, there's a, a known answer to this, uh, but it is a very important question. What I, sus I suspect that the answer is actually a little bit nuanced in that it is very context dependent. There are certain cases where it might be that the only thing you can do is just manually have somebody input, hey, this option is a bit more salient um, than this other option for some, you know, heads or tails. So you just encode it to some, say, hey, this option has the little epsilon. Um, even if you do that, you can then actually predict, uh, you know, you can have, for example, a noisily rational model uh, for each of the humans involved, and you can you can actually try to find the equilibrium response in terms of what is the probability distribution of each uh, player choosing each thing. If humans are perfectly rational, then the equilibrium response will go to you know 100%. Everyone will choose the one that has the little epsilon. Um, but you know, as uh, as we just saw, sometimes these models are probably simplifying things, and we're missing uh, other aspects. So we can at least try to account for the uh, deviation uh, from that with some with some noise and then you actually get to an equilibrium that is not 100 percent but it's maybe 90 percent um but the other thing that is very interesting is you you can actually ask where does this saliency come from right so these kinds of games uh shelling points uh usually come from one of the options or some of the options somehow feeling a little bit more more salient to the humans involved um, meaning it seems like a little bit more like the one to go for if we were to coordinate. So you can ask, where, where does that come from, right? And, you know, is there some statistical difference? If you happen to be doing natural language processing, you could have a massive, massive corpus of, uh, of all the things that people have written. And you could try to do some statistical analysis, whether you're doing it explicitly or, you know, implicitly through some big neural net that is coming up with some latent representation. And you can hope to find something that is effectively encoding what is a little bit more common and what people might end up coordinating on. Um, and I think that's, you know, that is in itself a really, a really fascinating question because I think, you know, from the, um, from the cognitive science point of view, we have some idea that, you know, this saliency factor is important, um, but characterizing that statistically from the data sets um, that we work with, I think is, uh, uh, potentially very exciting. Now, the question that I would, you know, sort of throw back at you is, how do you find the solution to that? Not from, you know, uh, a set of uh, texts, but if I show you a bunch of traffic data, or you know, behavior uh, from humans in different contexts where it's not necessarily clear, um, you know, there's no explicit communication, can you still find shelling points? Uh, say that I show you a bunch of pedestrians moving around in the city. Uh, maybe in certain cities, people tend to uh, avoid each other by moving to the left. Others tend to avoid each other by moving to the to the right. Um, 
is that and perhaps other kinds of coordination problems something that you can solve by doing some statistical analysis? And that I think is also very interesting. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. That's uh, yeah. That's really cool. I think shelling problems are absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I, as far as I know, the research that exists is basically just scratching the surface. I think there's more to be more to be said there. It reminds me a little bit of uh, the the question that group from ClearPath Robotics had, where they said that they're the people behaving in factories the, with their robots in Canada versus China had very different mm -hmm. ways of you know how fast they moved, the interaction that they did, all these types of like cultural uh, things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right, and and that's and that's it. Turns out it's super important. But, you know, you can sort of, uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, not being a social scientist myself, I always try to tread carefully here, but I know that one of the ways that people tend to think about culture is uh, sort of defined as it is a set of expectations, right? It's a collection of expectations. And very much in that, in that very same way, the shelling points, the coordination solutions that we go for are very much culture dependent. I would say not just culture dependent, they're kind of like culture defining. And so, um, so asking questions about shelling points is kind of linked to, you know, you, you need to ask the questions, um, including how culture relates to that. And that's also very interesting because then your robotic systems or your autonomous systems need to account for those factors when trying to coordinate with people. Ryan, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll take, oh, first of all, thank you so much for the, the presentation. And I was just sure. curious, how well the this um, uh, confidence aware modeling translates to more of a cooperative context. So take the same mm -hmm. sort of setup where you have a coffee spill in an office space. And now instead of just both parties of being that coffee spill, do you have a situation where I will slip and fall on my head and then maybe the, the quadcopter can do its best to help me, assist me uh, from, the fall or prevent me from fall like the so mm -hmm. is I was just kind of curious to your, your thoughts on those whether it's just as simple as taking compliments of certain definitions or it becomes a different challenge yeah no that's uh that's really interesting I think well I, I guess most squat cultures wouldn't be able to, to sort of pick you up as you're falling but if you imagine no, having yeah, some but... other kind of mobile robot that has wheels and arms mm -hmm. then you could uh, and you know it's actually it's not even it's it's not far fetched at all if you think of uh, robotic uh, caregivers. Um, this is very much an industry that there's a lot of interest in, as we see an aging population in uh, in a lot of countries. And so, um, being able to predict when a human is going to slip and fall is actually, I think, extremely valuable. Now, the way in which you would want your robot to to behave in this context is actually different right and so i think it's it's, it's a very good question how should you then plan because here the you don't want the robot to just say oh i'm gonna like you know stay clear of the human because they might go here actually you want the robot in this case to say maybe i don't want to go too far away from the human because i think there's a chance that they might trip and fall if they're an elderly human or maybe a um, an injured human who you're taking care of you maybe want to uh, very much the opposite rather than avoiding a collision you want to remain within range so that you can pick them up if they if they slip um so i think that then leads to um a different kind of question and we really didn't get to to talk much about it but it's the question of how do you combine your worst case analysis with your probabilistic prediction right so maybe there are certain things that you want to treat as a constraint for example you can say you know the human is um, very unlikely to trip and fall right now because the terrain right now is easy whatever you want but still there's some probability that they can fall and if that probability is very small if the cost of them falling is large and you don't want to allow that to happen then you may want to do worst case analysis on that and say, hey, the robot is never going to be outside of the backwards reachable set of the human within half a second, which is perhaps how long it takes you to detect the, the human tripping and, and, and uh, make sure that you're there to catch them if necessary. So yeah, I don't know if that uh, gives you at least a partial answer. I think 
I, I think ultimately it's not just a matter of flipping a sign and doing the compliment, but it is true that I think you can get you can get somewhere by saying instead of saying the robot needs to remain outside of a set, to say the robot needs to remain within a set, and then you can use probabilities to say, well, how you know how likely is it that the robot is going to need to rush to the human? If it's very likely, then maybe for efficiency purposes, it doesn't make sense to have the robot you know send the robot. Uh, relatively far away because it's going to need a you know a more drastic maneuver to get back uh, it makes sense to keep the robot relatively close whereas if you right now think that it's really very unlikely that the human is going to trip and fall it's more reasonable to, to let the, the robot be more far away for efficiency purposes uh, but still within the, set, the reachable set so that if the human trips even though this is very unlikely the robot will need to take some action and then the nice thing is you're no longer paying the cost of safety. You're just paying a cost of efficiency, right? If your prediction was wrong, then the robot will need to do something more inefficient, which is different from saying if your prediction was wrong, the human will fall and you know get injured and it's the robot's fault. I, I think that that also raises some questions related to what Nikhil was asking about before of like uh, when you have different dynamics that you need to reason about with the human. So you know hmm. maybe sometimes it's fine to think of the human as this like point mass that we've been looking at but when you actually have to interact with them you have to understand that they have arms and you know a body and they and whatnot and you have to reason in, with them in a more interactive type of way so there's an interesting question of when is it worth switching into uh, this more like refined model for an interaction task and when is it sufficient to just think of humans as just like points that move around in the space and i think that's yeah. It's still an open question. We try to implement Absolutely. something like this where we're like trying to implement a more sophisticated model of humans. But for this particular task of just like trying to navigate through a space around a robot, uh, it was like more efficient and safer to just do those super dumb, fast predictions and just reason over how confused you were instead of trying to use like a more sophisticated model, which was both uh, encouraging and frustrating for the research project. <laughs> yeah that's uh, i mean you know i think to some extent uh the the joy and the pain of uh of doing research projects in the lab is that often the toy problems that we work with are so simple that uh relatively straightforward methods work surprisingly well the, the problem then of course is that um those methods might not work so well when you're trying to apply them to a really complex scenario where you actually have a robot uh, you know, assisting a human or where you actually have a self-driving car in the middle of a city. Um, the other thing related to this is that one, one thing that I think is very interesting is sometimes it's just a matter of do I switch to the high fidelity model of the human from the simpler model? Uh, but other times I think, um, and you know, I know that you've been thinking about this quite a bit, Sylvia, it, there's multiple alternative high fidelity models that you could be using and they might actually be um, incompatible with each other or they might just be different domains, right? So there might be one where I'm thinking about the human as having arms and legs, which are necessary for this kind of motion. Um, there might be other cases where I need to think of the human as, uh, you know, a verbal reasoner who, you know, we're going to have some, who is going to give me some instructions verbally there might be other cases where I need to pay attention to the motion of the human's body because it's communicating information to me directly. And these might actually be different models that are, you know, high fidelity in different ways. And I need to, and I, the robot, need to know which one to be using at any given time. And it's, um, and it's tricky because also in practice, there might be computational limitations. So I might not be, you know, Maybe I can't afford to run all three of them in parallel and then say this one's working better. So then you have, you know, uh, a genuine sort of gamble-like situation where you have to try to pick up on different cues to figure out how to, you know, this is something that's shocking, just how perfectly fine humans, humans just know to do this, right? We're thinking about coordination and communication in different contexts. Um, but it's actually tricky to formalize and tricky to get the robot to do this right. <laughs> that was a great anyway. explanation. Nice. Well, hopefully, hopefully you all can see this is uh, you know a field with uh, a lot of different a lot of different unsolved questions. Um, 
and there's, I think, plenty to be done and plenty to be figured out. Yeah, you're here. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm